to the Museum of the City of New York. My name is Kubi Ackerman. I'm the director of the Future City Lab here at the museum, and I'm very excited to have you here for our inaugural event in our new uh, program series, Housing Tomorrow's City, which will explore one of the challenges presented in the Future City Lab, which is the interactive third gallery that's part of our New York at its core exhibition on our first floor, which covers 400 years of New York's past, present, and future. In this new series, leading thinkers, activists, researchers, and artists will be um, discussing and sharing their perspectives on the current state of housing in New York City, as well as innovative ideas on how New Yorkers will live in this city in the coming decades. And this entire series is dedicated to uh, the memory of uh, curator Hilary Ballin. I'd like to thank our, our affiliates for their promotional support of this series. We have a full list of uh, the affiliates in your print programs. And if, you're, if you or your organization are interested in becoming an affiliate, please let us know by emailing us at programs at mcny.org for more information. And I'd also like to let you know that uh, tonight's program and all the programs in this series are being recorded and will air on, uh, on uh, local access television on the Manhattan Neighborhood Network. Now, I don't have, I don't know the time uh, that tonight's program will air, will air, but if you're interested in revisiting it or sharing it, uh, you can check back on our website later on in the month where we'll have that information. So tonight we're here to discuss uh, housing, which is uh, a somewhat abstract term conjuring up images of uh, high-rise buildings and construction cranes. Uh, but of course, housing is also just what we call homes in the aggregate, and few of us think of our own living situation as housing. Uh, those of us lucky enough to have a stable place uh, to live in the city just think of it as our place in the city, the place that allows us to live here. And insofar as New York and its neighborhoods are defined by the people who live here, uh, there really is no more fundamental issue in determining the future of New York than uh, who will be able to uh, live here in the future. And that's very much an open question. Um, uh, on the one hand, the challenge of housing affordability in New York is very much uh, a question of, or, or a reflection of the fact that people still want to live here and people want to come here. And the, the demand for housing outpaces or outstrips the supply. And that's really a sign of the city's vitality and uh, certainly preferable than the alternative. Uh, but what we're here to consider tonight is whether the crisis in housing affordability in places like New York um, may also be an indication that the city and places like it are, uh, are in some ways a victim of its own success, and that the very reason that people would like to come here, the things, the attributes that attract people to the city, its energy, its diversity, its creativity, are threatened or diminished when the very people who provide those attributes are no longer able to live here. Uh, and we're starting to see indications of this. So in a city where rising rents have been outpacing rising incomes for many years, uh, that's simply unsustainable, and the effects of this are predictable. We've seen a 76% increase in homelessness over the past 10 years. Uh, we've seen low- and middle-income households increasingly being compelled to move out of the city. Uh, the African-American population has been declining for over a decade. And more recent trends are indicating that newer immigrants and younger generations, which are two groups that have consistently contributed to the growth and vitality of the city, are also potentially opting to uh, move to other cities or even to the suburbs rather than uh, having to contend with New York's high housing costs. Um, so these are developments that really threaten the social fabric of the city. And unlike uh, another big crisis the city's facing, that of public transit, so that one really plays out on, on a daily basis in a very public way and you know splashed across the headlines, whereas the housing crisis uh, in many ways uh, is less visible, often playing out in the, um, in the daily private anxieties on the part of households and individuals as they struggle to make ends meet uh, or uh, consider their increasingly diminished options and leaving traces in the piles of personal effects left on the curb that are the telltale signs of uh, for, uh, you know, a hasty move or eviction or in the, um, uh, you know, in the disintegration of a tight-knit community of neighbors as one and then another and another are forced to relocate. The de Blasio administration has an ambitious plan to address this issue, the Housing New York Plan, which aims to create or preserve 300,000 units of uh, affordable housing by the year 2026, and by many measures that's very much on track with 110,000 units already created or preserved since 2014. But many questions remain as to whether this is enough, what even qualifies under the plan as affordable, and where this new housing is to be concentrated, uh, with resistance from many communities targeted for such development, uh, and anxiety about whether these changes, intended as they may be to alleviate the burden of high rents, may in fact be exacerbating it for at least some existing residents in those areas. These are all open questions and difficult ones, and ones we hope to address tonight. And we have a fantastic lineup of speakers here uh, to help us do exactly that. So our speakers tonight are Dr. Edward Glazer, the Fred and Eleanor Glimp Professor of Economics in the Faculty of Arts and Sciences at Harvard University, 
He received his PhD from the University of Chicago, and his work has since focused on the determinants of city growth and the role of cities as centers of ideas transmission. Glazer's books include Rethinking Federal Housing Policy and, more recently, Triumph of the City. Dr. Miriam Greenberg is a professor of sociology at the University of California in Santa Cruz. She's the author of Branding New York, How a City in Crisis Was Sold to the World, and Crisis Cities, Disaster and Redevelopment in New York and New Orleans. Since 2013, she's been directing the Critical Sustainabilities Project, and since 2015, she's been co-organizing No Place Like Home, a project on the affordable housing crisis in Santa Cruz County. Matt Katz, our moderator, reports on air at WNYC on immigration, refugees, and national security. Katz formerly covered New York, uh, New Jersey Governor Chris Christie for more than five years. In 2015, he and a team from WNYC won a Peabody Award for their coverage of Governor Christie and the Bridgegate scandal. Please join me in giving them a warm welcome. Hello, everyone. Packed house. <laughs> it's... Uh, I'm so glad you were all here. There's so much going on nationally, and I think it's so uh, wonderful that you've taken the time out to uh, consider and think and, and listen to uh, policy that affects us so very locally. So I'm so glad we, we were able to fill the room. Um, thank you to Kubi Ackerman for the nice welcome and uh, Fran Rosenfeld for inviting me to, to moderate this. Um, Future City Lab is uh, an exciting and important contribution to the civic dialogue, and I'm glad to, glad to be a part of it. Um, we only have uh, an hour to solve the housing crisis in, Amer in New York City, so uh, let's get to it. Um, there are obviously very competing and complex political, economic, social forces that go into this discussion. Uh, I hope that we'll all leave here with a little bit of a better understanding about how this affordability crisis came about and maybe what can be done going forward. We're going to take some questions at the end uh, from the audience, of course. Um, so my, my housing expertise is limited to my own experience, and my own experience was when I graduated college in, in 2000, and my buddy Jeremy and I went to go rent an apartment in the Upper West Side, and we would, you know, get the ads still in Village Voice, and uh, would go and show up like an hour before, you know, we thought the day had started to go rent an apartment, and not only were there like 10 people ahead of us to look at the apartment, but it had already been rented by the time we got there. Um, and we, you know, we had somewhat of a limited budget. I was, uh, I was making $30,000 a year and driving to New Jersey every day for a newspaper job, so I um, had a car and I'd pay for that, um, and I'd pay for tolls. Uh, but uh, you know, I, th I thought that I should be able to afford uh, to find an apartment in the city, and we only were able to find one because Jeremy's brother had an inside <laughs> scoop with a guy who knew a guy in an apartment in 95th and Columbus. Right. So it, it seemed very clear to me this was a simple issue of supply and demand. Um, with my undergraduate political communication degree, that's what I determined. Um, construction just was not keeping up with uh, the desire to live in Sex and the City era in New York City. Um, so um, I, I wanted to start with Ed because he's written specifically about this issue of supply and demand in New York. Um, is that what got us to this point, generally speaking, a, a lack of supply and a great demand to live in New York? Could you, could you set the stage for some of the, the policy decisions and other factors involved in this supply and demand issue in terms of housing? Sure, sure, Matt, thank you. And, and you know, like, like most economists, I'm either simple or simplistic, and it is true that I do think that, that housing prices are typically reflecting the collision of demand and supply. Uh, but to understand this requires more than mere simplicity. And I want you to take you back to the 1970s, right? So I'm so glad to be here at this institution because I spent a lot of time here in the 1970s. There was a, there was a whole lot of kids programming here and, you know, really cool, fun stuff. And I think a lot of my love of the city of New York, the history of New York and the history of cities generally, was inculcated right here at this, at this museum. Um, but in the 1970s, of course, no one particularly thought that New York's future was, was bright. It's not just that President Ford in that famous Daily News headline was telling New York to drop dead. It felt as if history itself was telling New York to drop dead. The largest industrial cluster in the United States in the 1950s was not automobile production in Detroit. It was garment production right here in New York. And in a short number of years, hundreds of thousands of jobs were, were destroyed, right? Disappeared to globalization, disappeared to, to cheaper uh, locales. At the same time, you know, 
Crime rates had soared enormously. The city couldn't pay its bills. It felt as if the time of New York had come and gone and would not be coming again. And like many people, my parents bought a, a co-op in 1976, right, with, a, with money that had been, you know, forwarded on their credit card because that was, it was affordable in, in those years precisely because the future of New York seemed so bleak. Now, since that time period, something amazing and wonderful has happened, which is this city has reinvented itself once again. And it's reinvented itself around idea-intensive industries. It's reinvented itself as a place that is enjoyable to live as well as to work. I mean, the story that you tell of living in the Upper West Side to then work in New Jersey, that wouldn't have been a normal thing in 1973. No one was thinking, boy, you know, what I really want to do is put up with New York's crime rate and, and you know, <laughs> go, go live somewhere else. But the city had, had changed, and these natural urban virtues the virtues of urban innovation, the uh, virtues of the fact that cities are housing entrepreneurs who come in from everywhere, the fact that urban creativity spills over to all of us, whether it's in food trucks or in art or in you know, uh, just the ordinary conversation that we have, all of that became more recognized, became more valuable, and it then collided against relatively rigid supply. Right? And for a variety of very good reasons, New York had stopped building in the same way that it had from the 1950s previously. Right? It, it, certainly, we were never going to look back to the heydays of the early 1920s, where in some years, we permitted as much as 100,000 new u units in a given year. But even in post-war New York, there was a lot of building. A lot of it was held by, by public housing units. So there was actually a lot of supply coming on margin, uh, coming on, uh, online. But by the 60s and 70s, we became far less enchanted with the public housing solution. Um, we had erected far more rules about construction, some of which were sensible, some of which were less so, right? We were no longer comfortable building highly unsafe tenements, which of course was the cheap affordable housing solution in the, in the 20s and earlier. Uh, we decided that much of New York was worth preserving, was in the wake of the Penn Station renovation, uh, Penn Station de demolishment, we decided that we wanted to actually preserve our architectural past, and that increasingly put burdens on building. Right? On top of it, it just became more expensive to build, to build up. Hmm. All of those things made it more difficult for the city to respond to, to the increased demand. And it's that collision, the collision of the robust demand for this city as a, as a place of hope, a place of opportunity, a place of creativity, with the fact that it's just difficult to build here. And I want to make it clear, we are going to talk a lot about regulations, but even without regulations, building up is a lot more expensive than building out, right? It, it would be difficult to build here under any circumstance, and I think we need to, need to really, uh, really focus on this. But even, even given that, we can do better than we are. And we can do a better job of making sure that this city has, continues to do what it has since 1620, which is to open its arms to people throughout the world and say, there is hope here. And this is a place where you can find a, a future that is better than the past. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Miriam, do you want to talk about the, the, the supply and demand? I mean, are, are we facing a, a situation where there just aren't enough housing units coming on? And is that the... the the, the, the cause of this, or does it get more to, toward other issues that, that you've mm. looked at? Uh, well, I do think that uh, supply and demand plays an important role. I think the question also becomes, though, supply of what kind of housing mm -hmm. and the role that our policy plays in determining that one way or the other. So I think we have actually quite a robust supply of housing at the higher end of the market. And the question becomes, why can't we produce housing that's affordable for people at the lower end and in the middle range. Um, and, so, and I think some of that actually, it's, it's great that you kind of contextualize this in terms of the 1970s and the period following that. Um, I think we did see a shift in policy orientation following the 70s uh, away from kind of an emphasis on housing and other forms of you know, roles of the government producing the public good, whether it's in public education or you know, other kinds of uh, you know, parks or the commons and so forth that the public would provide a shift away from that towards the market trying to solve a lot of these kinds of problems. And the market is good at a lot of things. I think when it comes to housing, um, going back to the early part of the 20th century, uh, it's, you know, people in real estate would be the first to admit that it doesn't uh, make ends meet to produce affordable housing simply in the private sector. Uh, you know, people at the lower end, their, their rents don't cover the costs, don't pencil out, you know, for developers. Um, and so without subsidies, without, without other forms of support, without providing land and other, and other means, uh, we're not going to have that kind of housing. And I think over the course, significantly since 
you know, and perhaps due to some of the ways that the lessons of the 60s and the early 70s were learned in this country, different from in other countries in the, in the world, we moved away from that kind of a social housing approach. Um, and I think that explains a lot of the situation we're in today. Mm -hmm. I, I, uh, I was also, I was reading or looking through uh, your, your book, Branding New York, mm -hmm. and there was an, um, th this goes beyond supply and demand, it goes, it's a little more of a bigger picture look. Um, you wrote about uh, uh, so-called rebounds in the housing market, and you said they're, quote, driven and enjoyed by the local elites, out-of-towners, and recent transplants. These include real estate developers and sellers, financial investors and lenders, tourists and business travelers, luxury retailers and hotels, high-profile corporate tenants, and affluent consumers from around the country and the world. Um, you go on to say that this new economy, this uh, sort of playground of the rich concept, um, it brought with it the elimination of well-paid unionized jobs, privatization of public amenities, and then the near disappearance of affordable housing for average New Yorkers, along with the erosion of rent controls, welfare, social services. So in other words, this is not just a housing crisis, right? I mean, this is part of a, a larger uh, collapse of a, of a, of a multicultural working class New York City that mm. may, maybe have had uh, warts and many problems and uh, uh, the, the 70s in New York City, as you alluded to. But um, I, I'm just wondering if that means solutions have to be more all-encompassing, that when we look at the housing issue, it's not necessarily isolated. It's, it's a symptom of, of a larger thing. Mm -hmm. um, am, I, am I getting at something that uh, you, you, were, you were alluding to in that writing or that you, you've thought about? I mean, what other, um, uh, what else should we be thinking about in, 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 mm -hmm. when we talk about housing? Yeah, um, and I, I, I don't know if I should answer now, but um, yeah, please. so uh, <laughs> I'll go, you'll go again. Uh, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not worried. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah. um, so, um, I definitely, uh, through working on Branding New York and subsequent projects and now moving to California and seeing the affordable housing crisis in California and being mm -hmm. involved in, in this big survey project that I've been working on for the last around three years on the affordable housing crisis in Santa Cruz County. And the city of Santa Cruz actually, unbeknownst to a lot of people here probably, is the least affordable city in the country by a lot of measures because oh. of the disparity in, in average incomes and housing costs, uh, particularly for renters. Oh. Um, so I've become kind of really in the last couple years obsessed with this piece of the story that you're telling there, which is about housing. Um, but I do think, as you're saying, that it speaks to this, this larger shift um, towards a you know, kind of market orientation, that the market is going to solve these kinds of problems. Um, and, you know, in terms of housing in particular, you know, since the moratorium on the building of housing in the early 70s through the Reagan era, when there has been, there was a, around a 70% reduction in housing and urban development through to the current moment, um, you know, under, in the Trump administration, there was, a, there was an effort uh, last year to reduce the funding for housing by 18%, uh, which was actually fought off and wasn't achieved, um, $8.8 billion, was, was, there was an effort to cut that from HUD in the midst of this massive crisis, right? So, th which speaks to this kind of change in the mentality and in, in the kind of almost kind of policy ideology of our country that, you know, it's not for the government to fix this, it's for the markets to fix this. Um, and yet, I feel that a lot of the reason we're in the situation is because of the markets. Um, and so it's quite frustrating to see this. Mm -hmm. um, and it's not, um, you know, simply that we've seen a diminishing uh, pie, if you will. We've also seen a reorientation of that pie. We've seen, or, you know, this shrinking pie, uh, more and more of it is going to people who don't necessarily need it in the same way. So for instance, to homeowners as opposed to renters. Um, and actually I brought some, a, a couple of statistics because I didn't think I'd be able to remember them. Uh, while federal expenditures for direct housing assistance, uh, this is in 2012, was close to $50 billion, Homeowner tax, homeowner tax expenditures exceeded $220 billion. Okay, so more than four times that amount. With the lion's share of these funds from the public sector going to households with incomes over $200,000. Um, California is one of the worst in uh, culprits in this regard. $929 per owner household 
versus $71, so $929 versus $71 per renter household, which doesn't correspond to need, right? So the, the folks who are, you know, they, they already have a pie. <laughs> they don't need more pieces of pie. And the people who do need some support, yeah. uh, who are renters who face the greatest housing cost burden, who face the greatest, you know, uh, situations with overcrowding, with displacement, with dealing with major problems with their housing, with all the, with you know, issues of, of being uh, commuting longer and longer distances to get to their jobs and so forth, that associated with the housing crisis, only one in four of these renters are actually getting assistance. And actually, in our study in Santa Cruz County, we found 11% of the people who are eligible for assistance are getting it. Mm -hmm. So there's just this massive, um, from my perspective, sh you know, kind of priority issue around you know how not only what we're spending but how we're spending uh and how we're allocating the resources in, in this country um there are some other <laughs> things i could speak to but i think i'll leave it there for so, now so i want to yeah. get back to new york but i want to just rant for a second about the yeah. whole mortgage introduction if i may yeah. uh, <laughs> because i just i just i just think yeah. she was too kind to it <laughs> I, I i so so first of all obviously mm -hmm. there's the fact that there that is a massively inequitable policy right that homeowners earning more than two hundred fifty thousand dollars earn many multiples of the benefit owned by owners who are earning between 35 and seventy five thousand dollars the key site on this is Paterba and sinai from 10 years ago who actually go through this two right this policy induces people to buy bigger homes, right? Bigger homes cause the amount of carbon uses to scale up. If you were worried at all about trying to reduce the carbon emissions associated with households, the last thing in the world you would want would be a policy that encouraged people to, to buy bigger homes. Three, this policy is deeply anti-urban. Taken in the U.S. as a whole, more than 85% of single-family detached houses are owner-occupied. More than 85% of multi-unit dwellings are rented. When we have a social policy that says the American dream can only lie with home ownership, we are telling people to leave their urban rental apartments and move to the suburbs, to move to some single-family detached house. There is no reason why the federal government should be playing social engineer with people's ordinary lives. Four, right, what the U.S. government is doing is essentially encouraging people to leverage themselves to, to to the hilt to bet on the vicissitudes of housing. And as we saw over the past 15 years, this can easily create a foreclosure society rather than a, a, an ownership society, right? So for a variety of different reasons, this is just an absolutely mistaken policy. And we really do want to have something that is balanced, that doesn't take a, a stand between home ownership and renting. Now, I will say, just to bring this back, and then I'll see it back over to you, Matt, right? It is also somewhat outrageous, and I would refer any of you to the Furman Center's recent piece on property taxes in New York, that in fact, the property tax rates that New York levies on rental properties are substantially higher than the property taxes it rates on, on, uh, on owner-occupied properties of different forms, whether condos or single-family detached houses. That is equally outrageous. Right? And it's one in which New York has the power to shift that, and yet it doesn't. And you know, New York in 1890, 95% of New Yorkers were renters. Today, we're up to 32%. Every decade, it sort of cre in, terms of, in terms of owners, every decade, it creeps up a little bit. Renting is a fantastic way to experience New York. Right? If you're, the city is going to be open to people coming in for short-term periods, we need to embrace the rental stock. We need to build to rent. We need to have public policies that don't artificially bias against renting. And both at the city and at the national level, we, we lean on a side that favors owners far too much. Right. There's been a change in the tax bill. There were, was a change to the mortgage interest. Uh, to there was the a cap. cap. Move, the, move the cap down, which is the most politically feasible thing to do, which which I've been advocating for a while. Right. That was the. Um, so I think that was a positive. That was. I as think far that as was a concerned, positive, positive move. Positive. Absolutely. Yeah. And, and you, you've uh, argued against other, not only this, but other ways in which government has, has put its finger on the scale of housing policy in ways that you think have been negative, like uh, um, against uh, like zoning and governmental restrictions on height in certain neighborhoods, lot sizes in the suburbs. Um, can, can you elaborate on how highly regulated housing uh, markets like this one are is different from like a Houston, which you've written sure, about, and, and what would happen if we Houstonize New York City? For example? <laughs> it's sort of it's sort of unfeasible. I think it's helpful with this to actually start with how you define affordability, um, because in fact the way that we defined affordability as a society and policy discussions has really changed over the past 20 years, right? So 20 years ago, affordability meant that any person could come to New York City and rent or buy an apartment at a reasonable price. That that was how we defined affordability. And, you know, uh, there was a whole lot of policy discussion about whether or not we could ever get to that, that sort of world in which the housing markets would be fluid and workable. And then somewhere about 20 years ago, people came up with the idea with, well, we're not going to ever try to, we're never going to achieve that. So instead, we're going to start counting affordable units. We're going to create the separate housing class that we're going to call affordable. And instead of actually trying to create affordability for everyone, 
we're going to create a special class that's going to be those people who won the lottery to get into those units. And I was critical of that then, and I think that there are issues with it now as well, in part because it let politicians off the hook. So I'll just give you an extreme example about this. About 10 years ago, in my own highly nimbiest suburb where, where, I, where I live, the local politicians made the front page of the local paper because they were substituting the opening of, you guessed it, exactly one affordable housing unit. Exactly one affordable housing, as if this was a triumph for openness and equity and housing market efficiency in the area, that they had built exactly one unit, right? I worry as well about this focus on sort of quantities adding up, keeping 300,000, as whether or not that's pushing us too far away from the, the focus on making sure that anyone can come in and rent, not just the people who are lucky. But in fact, there are at least in fact, three different ways of thinking about housing affordability. So one is, you know, are normal prices and rents remotely reasonable? Um, that could get better in New York with the market, right? That could get better by, by you know, zoning less assiduously, by allowing higher heights, by allowing more delivery. And certainly, in lower density parts of the New York metropolitan area, it could get a lot better, right? That's an area in which we know the market can actually deliver, deliver single-family detached housing at fairly cheap, cheap prices in New York and, and elsewhere. And, and that is the point about Houston, right? That red state Houston, because it unleashes the developers in suburban Houston, does a much better job of providing that ordinary affordable housing than blue state Massachusetts or blue state New York. There's a second type of affordability, which is even if we let the market rip in New York, right? You're not going to get apartments which cost less than $350,000 or $400,000. You just can't do it with construction costs. Even if you sort of let everything go, just the barriers to building are too high. And so that's going to mean that lots of middle or lower middle income people are going to be priced out, even with the, the best that the market can offer. And as much as I'm in favor of allowing at least a bit more freedom in terms of building, I recognize that those, you know, middle income New Yorkers are still not going to be able to afford a lot of those units. So there's a second role of affordability, which is to make sure that New York remains economically diverse. Right? And I get that as well, and I think that's, that's a worthy aim, and that's in some sense what lies behind the bulk of what, what the de Blasio affordable housing plan is, and it's, it's trying to create a city that remains a, a panoply of economic diversity. And then there's a third element with, with, uh, with housing affordability, which I think is, was really highlighted by, by your comment, which is, what are we doing for the poorest New Yorkers? Right? What are we doing to make sure that you know, we're trying to deal with homelessness, that we're dealing with the really desperate? And that is a different group. That's a group that you know, normal affordable housing prices aren't going aren't to help. That's a group that desperately needs housing vouchers or targeted public housing assistance. And that requires sort of a third aim. And in some sense, we need to balance all three elements in this three-ring circus as we trade off different aspects of, of our housing policy. Let's talk about that third aim. The, the poorest New Yorkers, uh, NYCHA, uh, New York City Housing Authority, deeply troubled and uh, it's, it's deeply in debt. Um, there's uh, improvements that are necessary. How, how do you, Miriam, view um, addressing the needs of the, 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 the poorest New Yorkers? Um, is public housing uh, a critical piece of the housing puzzle? Does it perpetuate the concentration of, of poverty if it's you know, amassed in certain areas? Um, should these properties be knocked down and revitalized and rebuilt? Um, entirely by the government. Um, how, how, do you, how do you help hmm. those people? Well, I think it's definitely true that for extremely low-income folks who are eligible for, uh, for public housing, that they, but I think also people even further up uh, the income ladder are not going to be able to find affordable housing in this market. And I think one of the questions also becomes, how do you measure affordability? Mm -hmm. Do you measure affordable? And one of the issues also, um, unfortunately, with the de Blasio plan is often that area median income is being used to measure affordability, which takes in you know, the greater metro area rather than neighborhood uh, affordability. So many of the projects that are going up in particular neighborhoods are actually completely unaffordable to people currently living in those neighborhoods mm -hmm. with, with the rezonings, but that's a question we can get to. Mm -hmm. When it comes to public housing then, uh, though, yes. I mean, I think it's one of the last things that exists in many neighborhoods in Manhattan, certainly, and in the boroughs um, that allows low-income people to stay here. Uh, and it needs to be defended. It needs to be, and I think here as well as across the country, and there is a, a movement afoot to, to try to do this, um, there needs to be uh, really a uh, re-funding uh, of uh, HUD and of public housing in this country. It's a key part of, it's a key tool in the toolkit, as it were, um, to, to support low-income people. I think there are, other, there are other tools that can be used and that we can maybe talk about. Um, 
certainly um, subsidies, inc you know, including um, Section 8 can be expanded. Um, right now, there are enormous waiting lists, both to get into public housing as well as for Section 8, and, and most landlords, you know, not Don't taking take Section 8. Big problem, right? Um, and so how do you address that and expand those roles? But also, how do you kind of think about taking a lot of housing and land off the market entirely? Since we're seeing that the market is not solving the problem, what would it mean to demarketize housing, to decommodify housing, mm. and to create uh, models of housing, uh, construction, maintenance, uh, provision that are run by communities themselves, like community land trusts, which is actually a movement around the country that's kind of has its heart right here in New York City. It's kind of expanding most rapidly here in New York. It, that doesn't face, I mean, often when there's efforts to bring in affordable housing, there's community opposition, even if people ostensibly mm -hmm. believe that they, that, that people should be in homes. Uh, that model, is, is, uh, is, is that an easier way of doing it in terms of, um, a smoother way of doing it in terms of community opposition and people that might be coming out to meetings and not mm -hmm. wanting the, the, the big affordable housing units coming in next door? That's an interesting question. Um, so you're kind of alluding to, and I think that Ed was kind of talking about sort of NIMBY opposition For sure. to development, yeah. which is something I'm painfully familiar with in Santa Cruz um, and in coastal California. And I think that there's different kinds of NIMBY opposition. I think there's NIMBY, so not in my backyard, uh, kind of approaches of, you know, now that we've shifted to all of this empowerment of homeowners in this country, and I think you're totally right, this kind of anti-urban shift, both in funding and in sort of political valence towards the suburbs and towards homeowners um, and towards real estate, uh, we see that these empowered homeowners are up in arms a lot of the time when there's any kind of development that's being done that they think is going to affect their property values, their quality of life, and so forth. Um, and this is a bit. This is a big issue um, in California. Um, and at the same time, there are community residents who are opposed to new developments in their communities, often because they're worried that it's going to push them out. Mm -hmm. um, who are at the lower end of the spectrum and who may also be dubbed NIMBYs. This is something that's going on in the Bay Area right now. Um, for instance, in San Francisco, in the Mission District, where there's been a lot of opposition to developments that may have an inclusionary zoning provision that includes, let's say, 10% um, affordable, which may not even be built on site, but may be you know, paid for through an in-lieu fee. And neighborhood groups who are very organized may oppose that and may be dubbed NIMBY for doing so, but it's because they're hoping that there would be actual, real, true, affordable housing built in their community. Um, so I haven't really seen those communities opposing building new public housing. Mm -hmm. um, I've seen more, uh, and this is something when I talk to um, nonprofit developers in Santa Cruz, you know, just that it can take five to 10 to 15 years to simply get siting approved for an affordable housing development uh, in suburban communities in order to kind of smooth over people's kind of anxieties about these things. And of course, there's all kinds of spurious land, uh, lawsuits that are, you know, law, uh, law firms that make their money by using California's Environmental um, Quality Act in blocking um, development after development, usually in, in areas that are primarily affluent and white, um, pr uh, blocking affordable housing. So I see much more of that happening in, in those kind of affluent um, majority white areas than mm -hmm. I do uh, otherwise. When it comes to the question of community land trusts, however, uh, because I don't think there's actually been the opportunity for a lot of low-income communities to kind of oppose public housing because it's not being proposed sure. and being built. Um, but certainly there is a kind of a buy-in and a kind of, you know, community land trusts are governed collectively, um, not only by people living in there, but by people in the surrounding neighborhood. Um, and so it also creates this really remarkable opportunity for not only affordable, but really democratic housing solution. Uh, generally speaking, the way the system works is uh, for-profit developers build build the housing, and and they, as as was alluded to before, they invariably claim that uh, building more affordable housing uh, doesn't necessarily make financial sense, and therefore they simply won't build it unless they get help from the government. Um, Ed, are are developers bluffing? Um, could they be building more affordable housing and making affordable housing a bigger piece of their developments? And um, if so, or if not, regardless, uh, what could city council, Mayor de Blasio be doing to, to, to push a greater mix of affordable housing in these developments? Uh, I mean, 
there shouldn't just be Russian oligarchs living in, in these uh, massive skyscrapers, right? <laughs> that's, 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 that's certainly right. Um, so uh, in some sense, I think about the affordable housing requirements as trading off the first type of affordability against the second type of affordability, right? So they're, they're, the more that we require affordable housing requirements, we're going to make it more difficult to, to build. And it's essentially, these affordable, affordable housing requirements are a tax on new development, right? And you never promoted more development of a thing by taxing it, right? So we're inevitably meaning that there will be less supply of non-affordable housing if we increase the affordable, the affordable requirements. Now, that doesn't mean that that's wrong. We may, in fact, want those affordable units, but we're inevitably reducing the overall supply of new units at the, at the same time. Now, I actually think that the right answer is not to, not to eliminate the affordable housing requirements, but to figure out what else makes it so difficult to build in New York City. What else makes it so hard to assemble land? What else makes it so hard to get through a 10-year, a 15-year process? So this means asking ourselves, you know, if there are cases in which the uh, intervention is, in which the regulation clearly makes very little sense, for example, proposals to downzone all of the Upper East Side, which in the wake of particularly the Second Avenue subway is something which is sort of almost unimaginably unwise in terms of, of putting artificial restrictions on, on new development, right? Uh, that's the type of thing that seems sort of, you know, clearly not something that makes very much sense in terms of making things difficult. My own preferred solution has always been, let's charge the developers to make it faster, let's charge the developers to make it you know, easier to build, and then let's plow that money back into whatever it is that makes the lives of poorer New Yorkers better. One way to see city government in a city like New York is you can think of the city as essentially a for-profit real estate company that is owned entirely by a non-profit poverty alleviation company. Right? And the goal is to get as much resources out of the property development side in order to do whatever is most effective to aid the poorest New Yorkers. And that may mean affordable housing units, and that may mean better pre-K programs, and it may mean any number of things that are good for making the lives of poor New Yorkers better. But you know, it's sort of critical to keep in mind that they're, they're, we, we've got to manage to figure out where we can deliver value in the system. Right? And value in the system comes by you know, essentially allowing development and then taxing it in some way. And whether or not that taxes by ratcheting up the affordable housing requirements or by charging higher impact fees or something else, right? we've got we've to work on that margin to make sure that we're supplying both more of the normal units and more of affordable units at the same time. And I will just say one final thing about California environmentalism. The crazy thing is that if you actually measure carbon emissions, right, building in California is by far the greenest place you could possibly build in, in the U.S. Right? because of the Mediterranean climate. Right? It, carbon emissions in the U.S. are determined by January and July temperature above all, which would mean that you would think that if you were a California environmentalist, you would be cheering for every high-rise building project on BART that you could possibly build. Right? And yet, they're not. And in fact, the whole environmental impact process is skewed towards thinking only about the local environmental impact, but not at all about the global environmental impact. But every time you turn off development outside of San Francisco, it turns on outside of Houston. It turns on outside of Phoenix. It turns out in some place where the environmental impact is much worse. Right? And in the same sense, right, New York is intrinsically green. And it's intrinsically green because people walk, because they live in relatively small, small units, right? And consequently, like making sure that we enable enough building, making sure that we don't artificially downzone whole, whole parts of the city is not just about an enabling opportunity for people. It's not just making sure that we can extract more affordable housing units out of the developers. It's also about making sure that we live in a way that's more environmentally sensitive. <laughs> I see you not, did you, did you have, it seemed like <laughs> I, it's something yeah, no, like that. Um, that's um, something, an issue close to my heart uh, and something, you know, I came, I was working and teaching in New York and I moved to Santa Cruz as an, as an urbanist, as an urban mm -hmm. sociologist. Um, and that seemed, you know, unfathomable to a lot of people <laughs> that, you know, what would an urbanist be doing in Santa Cruz? Santa Cruz isn't a city. Um, and I think that's the philosophy, that's kind of the mindset of a lot of folks uh, and I'm, I'm actually from Northern California, so I can speak of this with some authority, um, you know, in the Bay Area, that they've somehow managed through, you know, constructing windy kind of roads and, um, right. and, and uh, cul-de-sacs and so forth to escape these kinds of urban issues. And um, that's, that's not the case by any stretch. I think, so densification um, is enormously important, questions of transit-oriented development, many of which actually were, were kind of... Um, were really tried out and uh, celebrated early on in California, um, and Northern California in particular has also kind of been a test bed of a lot of the kind of urban sustainability efforts um, need, you know, need to be brought back at the same time that I, I do believe that 
questions of affordability need to be associated with them in a much more intimate way than has been the case with kind of the history of smart growth and, and those kinds of planning. So, um, so for instance, um, Santa Cruz uh, was very ahead of its time in the 70s and 80s in doing growth management and subsequently many other places did and they created these green zones um, and they created an urban services line and they said all the development should happen in a kind of dense pattern within this kind of cordon and we should have inclusionary zoning and we should you know, build up and so forth. And so they created this big, this big kind of border around the county and then in the 90s, they downzoned within that space. And they said, okay, everything within this now delimited area is going to be single family homes. Um, and that's not uncommon in the West. It's what we see also um, in, even in Portland, Oregon and other places. Um, and so you suddenly create this kind of limit of what, how affordable. And, and a kind of like one of the things that, you know, people writing about this issue in the civil rights era talked about is de facto segregation because who can afford to live in these houses and it becomes a way of kind of keeping out right. all kinds of undesirables. Um, at the same time, now there's this effort to upzone along transit corridors, uh, but affordability isn't always part of that conversation. And one of the things that my colleagues at UC Berkeley have found is that actually uh, transit-oriented development that does not include affordability has a paradoxical effect of increasing the carbon footprint for the region because it increases, it, it leads to gentrification and displacement, which pushes workers out to the far-flung suburbs that don't have public transit, who end up driving in longer and longer distances, in many cases in our region, two hours to get to work. Um, even when there's these beautiful, shining transit-oriented developments, you know, in the heart of San Francisco. Um, and so if you don't couple TOD and sustainability with affordability, you have these really contradictory effects. We're, we're going to uh, go to questions in, in just a few minutes. Uh, I'm going to ask a final question. Actually, it's a two. I'm going to give you a choice. One is harder <laughs> than the other. The first, I'll give you the harder question first. It's, it's a more of a, a thought experiment. Um, I was curious that if you could summon your, your inner Robert Moses and redesign, <laughs> perhaps, a, a neighborhood in New, of New York, or an area of New York, uh, fix everything with it, with a magic wand from zoning to, to the, the residential mix, to the commercial mix, um, is there a particular neighborhood in New York City that you would do that to and why and what might you do to make it more housing friendly and, and fair to all people? That's the harder question. The easier one um, if you, it would be, is there a particular neighborhood or development project um, that exists right now or that's in the, in the pipeline right now that you th you're excited by, that you think is a good uh, model going forward uh, that you've read about or seen or experienced or know about? Now silence. I'm gonna no. I'm gonna take the harder question. Okay. I would bulldoze the neighborhood I grew up in. Wow. How about what that? neighborhood? The uh, Upper East Side of New York. For, but but the uh, <laughs> the uh, so I would I would bull, not not the not the place oh, these guys live. The place further east where I grew up. Uh -huh. uh, but you know glazed brick post-war buildings. Uh, I would replace them with buildings that are three times taller or whatever whatever we think uh, can can actually wear. So I would actually I would actually bulldoze the buildings that I that I grew up in. Th these are these are historically protected. Some of them I imagine. Some of, some of it is, but none of them are really important architecturally. I mean, my, my father was an architectural historian, right? So he was certainly quite snobbish about many of these buildings, which now are part of the New York Historic uh, Preservation District for the Upper East Side. No, I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't, look, I mean, I certainly view, like, New York's great buildings as being architectural treasures that are no less worth protecting than, you know, the Brancacci Chapel or, you know, uh, or the, the, the Ghent altarpiece. Uh, but um, the, the, there's a lot of fairly mediocre post-war architecture in New York that could come down, okay? <laughs> and could be replaced with a lot more stuff. Um, and on top of that, we could put a lot of affordable housing in, in the empty retail spaces that New York now right. has on the other ground. But, but um, no, we, we, I, I mean, I'm obviously being slightly facetious, but only slightly. I mean, I think, I think actually we need, to, we need to not be as sentimental uh. about buildings that really aren't all that exciting, and we need to allow change just as, I mean, remember in 1908, right, there was a furious movement to stop any high-rise development along Fifth Avenue by the rich guys with their houses like the Frick Museum, right? They lost, and we got high-rise houses, we got high-rise structures along Fifth Avenue. That was not a terrible thing, and we need to continue to change, and we need to continue to make the right trade-off where we don't leave the city of the future hostage to the city of the past. Yeah. 
Can I just ask how crowded the six train would be if there were <laughs> people living block after block in a hundred story I buildings? I thought there was all that capacity on the Second Avenue subway. That's I mean, right, they, that's they've right. They've been building that my over. entire life. I forgot right? we fixed it's, that. Uh... <laughs> <laughs> Do you have an answer uh, to either of those, Miriam? So, um, I think that's a fabulous idea. I guess my only concern would be that there would be thousands and thousands of Russian oligarchs living in these buildings. <laughs> and so I would just hope that there would be tenants' unions in those buildings or that there would be other ways of ensuring that, that rents would be stabilized uh, and that there would also be alternative ownership models that wouldn't be purely in the market hmm. um, to ensure that we can have, as, as you were saying, the economic diversity, the cultural diversity, uh, the vitality of New York maintained. And I'm thinking about... Um, you know, limited equity co-ops that New York is also incredibly famous for. Um, I have a couple of friends here in the audience actually who grew up in East Midtown Plaza, um, which is part of the Mitchell Alban development. And I don't know how many people in the audience grew up in a, in a limited equity co-op in New York. I don't know if anyone were. A uh, couple of hands. <laughs> yeah, a few hands, okay. Um, and the Amalgamated was the first limited equity co-op in, in the country and it's been going strong for 90 years. Um, Michelama and other, other limited equity co-ops targeting the middle income um, sector have been um, enormously um, fruitful in providing housing for people of all income groups. And that, however, has been eroded because of the limitation of, of the, the, the leases. Um, and so now people are talking about combining limited equity co-ops with community land trusts so that the land underneath is, is held um, in perpetuity and there's permanently affordable housing in New York. So um, I would just like to see in a, you know, the question of the housing type combined with the policies governing affordability um, and the structures of governance themselves democratized you know, within that housing. Very good. Thank you both so much. We're going to take some questions from the audience. The way we're going to do this, we're going to take uh, two questions at a time. These are extremely smart people, so they will remember your questions. Um, <laughs> we think that will allow us to get to more people uh, as quickly as possible. Do we have a mic, or are we just going to... We don't necessarily need one. Okay. There's a woman in the second row with, a, I believe, a teal sweater. Hi there. Hi. Hi. Um, just FYI, by the way, every neighborhood that Robert Moses tore down and rebuilt was less dense than the one he tore down and more expensive. So you should just know that. Interesting. Fair um, enough. Thank you for that. For the last uh, decade and a half, at least, starting in the Bloomberg administration, uh, the city has done what you suggested, Mr. Glazer. It has upzoned. At this point, I've lost track. It was 110 neighborhoods under Bloomberg and probably another 20 since. since. And in each case, existing buildings got either torn down and rebuilt expensively, displacing the affordable units in them, or bought, vacated, and uh, upgraded expensively. No one is, well, there's one young man trying to do this, but no one counts how many units we are losing for every new building in these upzone neighborhoods. And that is mostly at the heart of what the so-called NIMBYs are fighting about. Of course they're afraid of being displaced. They will be. Every upzone neighborhood, this has happened. And I defy someone to actually uh, take some kind of survey. And I am convinced, because I've done some of my own research, that we will come out with as many lost as we might have built, and the new ones are more expensive than the ones we lose. Thank you, and we'll get to a response on that. Uh, we'll take one more question and we'll hold it in the bank. Yeah, yes, sir, with the glasses right there. Uh, hi, my name is uh, Yin. Uh, actually, uh, I'm, I'm an international student at YU. So I'm thinking, uh, how does uh, New York as an international real estate investment market, uh, this, this, uh, this market influence the surging price for housing? The is international it, market influencing the surging price. Yeah, I mean, uh, New York is like the top choice yeah. for real estate investment uh, internationally. Uh, 
And would that be a really serious cause for the surging housing price? Like people just, uh, foreign money just keep coming and coming. And that's why it influenced the local uh, housing affordability. Yeah, Very thank good. you. W what country are you from? I'm from China. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for your question. Welcome. Um, would either of you like to take the, the question on the, the upzone neighborhoods or the uh, question about the international sure. market uh, influence? I'll respond to both of them. Please. Um, the, the, the question of actually what the impact of foreign buying is on prices is actually very hard empirically. Right? So in fact, even knowing the full quantities involved in terms of foreign ownership of U.S. apartments is, is hard to tell. There's no question this is a global city. It's part of an interlinked uh, market. It surely makes some difference. Most of the time, the, the, the impact of foreign, foreign buyers is somewhat demagogued. So I would be somewhat wary about claims that it's obvious that that's yanking the whole market. But assuredly, it's, it's not nothing. Um, you know, uh, my own view is that, in fact, there, there often are very good things about New York selling real estate to non-U.S. investors. I mean, I lived through, as many people here did, right? All the tumult about when Rock Center was sold to the Japanese in the late 1980s. Remember that? Remember how horrific that was in the time when we sold it at, you know, sky-high prices and then bought it back at pennies on the dollar, right? Which, you know, ended up being a, you know, a very helpful in terms of the U.S. balance sheet, in terms of the capital account balancing out the current account. So I, I think actually this is an area in which it's, it's easy to get, to get frightened and it's, it's, it's a mistake. I mean, New York, New York should be a global city and should be, should be always open uh, to, to, global, to global visitors and to global investors. On the upselling, you know, uh, when, it, when you see 157 rise, right, it's like a dagger in my heart in some ways because all, all that I believe that new supply can do that's good it seems to be given the lie when you see apartments that are built with exactly you know, 12 housing units that are, are of a ridiculously large level, right? And I tell, also, us, tell us about 157. Sum it up for those of us. Where it is. Yeah, yeah where it is. It's on 157, right? right. It's a, it's a the, tall... The size of there the... Are, there yeah. are not... You know, there are a small number of units, and they're, sure. they're very... Uh, um, it's, and, and, you know, this is, this is your phenomenon. So uh, that's not a question. That's not an issue with densification. That's an issue with the way that we've rigged the housing policy, right? We've rigged the housing policy in such a way that, you know, the only units that make sense to get through such a difficult housing thing are those that actually play for the very rich. It doesn't need to be. So, right, just to be clear, right, uh, you heard some strategies for making things, making things easier. I would also do it by, uh, I would probably focus more on just fast-tracking units that are reasonably sized, that are smaller units, that are targeted towards rental payments. I would do it through the regulatory apparatus and that it would make it much more difficult to actually build luxury condos at the high end and much easier to build mid-sized apartments in the middle, middle round. And I absolutely refuse to take any blame whatsoever for the Corbusier-inspired uh, Robert Moses projects, which are not at all what I'm talking about in terms of densification, and they bear absolutely no resemblance to how I think actually you know, cities should or do work. But I will say, in Robert Moses' defense, that Hillary Ballin put on a superb exhibit, providing some nuance to his, to his life at this museum. And indeed, as a child, I can remember, you know, every pool that I swam in was due to Robert Moses. Every, every park that I played in owed something to Robert Moses. And, you know, I think Hillary Ballin's nuanced approach to the history, right, one that balances the bad against the good, was actually, I think, worthwhile. Mm. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I remember reading something, I'm trying to remember by whom now, um, maybe with by Herbert Mouchamp in the Times, about how both uh, Moses and Jacobs would be horrified by what's <laughs> happened to New York City um, today. And this was during the Bloomberg administration when the kind of luxury city development was really taking off um, in a big way. And that, you know, yes, there were the, you know, so, so Moses was somebody who, for all kinds of idiosyncratic reasons, which we could get into, was like appalled by the tenements um, and believed in tearing them down and building these modernist structures uh, that would both kind of uplift the working classes uh, and you know show a new face of the city to the world and attract investment and so forth. Um, and so he was really kind of, I think, celebrating the middle class in a big way, however um, effectively. Um, similarly with his developments, you know, on Long Island and elsewhere, and you know, with parkways and beaches and, and so forth and parks. Um, whereas, you know, again, thinking about these structures, how do we think about the social relations, the political relations surrounding these structures and what are the policies governing them and to what degree do we, um, yes, um, not 
allow ourselves to kind of fall uh, into this anti-urban um, mindset and uh, and to sort of fetishize or privilege certain housing types that are small and separated and so forth, and to celebrate living in close quarters with one another on environmental <laughs> grounds, on mm -hmm. cultural grounds, um, at the same time that we think about you know what kinds of policies need to be in place in order to assure affordability and how much of the market needs to actually be uh, kind of taken off, how, how much of the housing stock, I should say, needs to be taken off the market in order for that to, um, to be a reality. So, um, and in terms of the question about foreign investment, yeah, I mean, I think that that's part of that question. So I think a lot of development has been happening understanding that there is kind of different flows coming from China, coming from, uh, coming from Russia, coming from, from elsewhere that we can capture. Hong Kong is capturing. We're, we're in competition with Vancouver, with, you know, with, with these big cities around the world, watching these flows happening, particularly when the housing market is becoming financialized. Um, and in which local housing stock is being seen primarily as a commodity to be bought and sold um, as an exchange value rather than as a use value. And we have these ever expanding markets and real estate investment trusts and equity firms and so forth that are trying to compete at this level, not thinking about the impact it's gonna have on the ground. And there's you know, a place for that potentially. How much of our market should be turned over to that is the question. Um, and you know, it can mean huge boom and bust cycles, you know? And what happens when the boom busts? And what are we gonna do in that situation? I think one of the examples from the 70s actually that's instructive is that we saw this kind of huge influx of capital that then dries up and there's all of these derelict properties, right? And there's this kind of abandonment. And then in that period, the government of the city and others organizing felt that it was an opportune moment to then say, all right, people can take over those in-rem properties and take them off the market. Um, and we didn't see the same thing in 2007, 2008, for instance, after the crash. Um, and so the question becomes, what do we do uh, in the face of these kind of market forces? Thanks. <clears throat> we'll go to get a couple more. Yes, sir, in the, you're in the second row. Can you speak to some of the bills introduced at the federal level? Uh, I'm thinking of Elizabeth Warren's uh, estate tax and um, Kamala Harris's, uh, was it Renters Relief Act? And just the role you think the federal government can have in incentivizing investment in affordable housing and also in production across the board? There's a gentleman with a white button down shirt. How you doing? Thanks for coming. Um, so I think when a lot of people think about affordability, we naturally think of the actual housing units themselves, but I'm curious to hear what you think of retail and how it contributes to it. So I mean, from one angle, it's nice if you could live in an affordable unit in Williamsburg, but if you can't afford the $10 coffees, it doesn't really help your affordable living situation. Mm -hmm. And then, then on the other end, is, in your opinion, New York and other cities just over-retailed? Is there a way that where we could pass policies to incentivize people to come in and say live in the spaces instead of having them all be stores and how you think the city could contribute to to that thanks only ten dollars for a coffee that uh, <laughs> sounds like a bargain are, are either of you familiar with um senator harris or senator warren's bills that the gentleman referred to or can you speak to the the federal government's um I think any, we, any we both who speak to the federal government's role in this thing sure be, uh, but do you want to yeah. you want to go uh, uh sure um, yeah, I mean, we could speak generally about, yeah, these are um, some colleagues of mine in, in urban sociology have this, this new issue out of a journal called um, Who Said Cities Can Save the World? And it's really um, kind of focused on this, there has been this wonderful celebration of cities um, that is deserved. And many of the innovations that are occurring right now um, in when it comes to urban sustainability, when it comes to sustainability planning, when it comes to you know, all kinds of issues surrounding immigration reform, for instance, when it comes to and sanctuary cities, when it comes to housing development and innovations in housing development are happening at the local scale, but that's often because the federal government has abdicated its role in this, in this era or has you know, 
there's at the international scale, there's so much chaos and, and so much politics, you know, that are so difficult to overcome and there's more flexibility, you know, at the local scale. And that's true and there's great models and inspiration to be found in a city like Bogota or in a, ci or in a city like Vienna um, on, this, on these grounds or in, you know, in Hong Kong for that matter, um, as we were talking about earlier. But there's only so much they can do, right? And I think it's an enormously important question um, if we're talking about doing this at a scale that's gonna be really meaningful. Um, and let's say in New York, actually, in New York State, so there's this new coalition called the Upstate Downstate um, Alliance that's saying, you know what? The housing crisis is not just in New York City, it's throughout New York State. Right. And it's in rural communities and it's in small towns. And this is, a, this is an issue of urbanization more generally, not simply bounded by a city. Um, and how do we take on something at that scale? This is certainly the case for California, for the state of California. And so how do we take on large scale issues like this? We need the federal government. Um, and we need the federal government to be obviously responsive um, to the needs of localities and to cities. We certainly could have better urban policy at the federal government, um, but we also need more broad scale um, affordable housing policy, renter relief policies. I, I am a big supporter of Kamala Harris's bill. I'm not as familiar with um, Elizabeth Warren's bill, but I'd like to learn more about it. But in general, for instance, you know, the housing trust fund that was created um, in the Obama period, which has been slashed in the current period, um, and housing trust funds more generally, are one way of kind of trying to override the moratorium that was, that was imposed in the early 70s on building new uh, public housing. Thanks. Uh, so, so four four points. So first of all, I just need to need to point out that like down zoning is not a, a friend of, of integration. Right. So, in fact, we know quite well from, you know, what are fairly sophisticated statistical techniques that involve comparing the blocks that are zoned for multifamily with blocks that are zoned for a single family that are right next to each other and that are still within the same jurisdiction, still within the same taxes. The ones that are, don't allow multifamily are much wider. OK, so it's not as if this this down zoning is somehow or other a positive thing for encouraging, encouraging integration. Second point, um, second point that 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 I, I want to stress on the federal government's role. So traditionally, traditionally, economics has had a very clear view on this, which is however much you think should be paid for to take care of the poorest and most vulnerable Americans, that bill should be largely paid for by the federal government. Right? And there are good reasons for that, that, and in some sense they're based on the history that we had in the 1970s, that when you try and run a local welfare state where you ask just the neighborhood New Yorkers to pay for all the, ca all the costs of taking care of the poorest New Yorkers, they have a disturbing tendency to run away, to move to suburbs, to, to do something else. And not only that, it's just a matter of social justice. Right? Why is it that we think that it should be the people who live right next to the poor who should bear the costs of trying to care for them. Surely it's all of our responsibility. I might even make that claim globally, except that would be seen as too outrageous in, in, the, in the modern context. But certainly nationally, that, that's a view. Now, that being said, right, we're in a world in which many people, myself included, feel that the federal government has abdicated too much on its responsibility to care for the bottom fifth, the bottom tenth of Americans. And consequently, cities have you know, increasingly taken up, taken up the bill. And in some sense, all of this discussion about local, local affordable housing is because we don't think the federal government is doing enough with Section 8 housing vouchers or with other things the federal government should be doing. So do I think the federal government should be doing more for the poor? Absolutely. But in some sense, we're living in a world in which we've accepted that it's not, and we're asking what can the, what can the city do, despite the fact that it runs that risk of trying to be too generous leads to some sort of a, some sort of a fear. Third, on, on local retail. So first, just point of fact that I want to emphasize. You're right, the, the can, you can find 10 buck coffees in New York, but it's the only place that I know in America where you can get a really good $1 slice of pizza, okay? Right. And Very in true. fact, New York is also a place in which, you know, you know how to shop, the retail can also be in part because of the, like, the vast scale, the fast pace of the things. Retail can actually be not a source of being, uh, 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 things being too expensive. It can be a source of uh, reasonable affordability. Uh, that being said, right, New York is clearly in the midst of a bit of a retail crisis, and you're right, maybe some of that space can be repurposed for various things, whether or not that's housing or community spaces, libraries, whatever, something, something creative around retail space. But that being said, I would never want to push against retail in New York. I would never want to push against services in New York. Because I, I want to just put this in a larger perspective, which is we, we are in a world in which there is a, a, a terrifying amount of debate over the future of work in this world. Right, especially for less skilled Americans, right? And just to put a fact on the table, when I was born in 1967, uh, fewer than 
of what are called prime-aged males uh, uh, were jobless. Today, that number is over 15%. It has been such for most of the past decade, right? So a tripling in the joblessness rate for prime age, prime age males. And the reason why I find it so offensive is it's defined as 25 to 54. And as I'm coming to the upper grade on that, it's, it's becoming uh, increasingly problematic. Secondly, obviously, it's a, it's a comment about men, right? And there are similar issues with women, but the women f labor force participation decision is just more complicated. So forgive me, I have no sense of my suggesting any lack of, of care or attention to the to issues around female employment, but it is, it is more complex in terms of the data. Now, when you look at America, this joblessness that has risen is not uniform. It's not typically a, fa a feature of the coastal cities. It's a feature of a great epicenter of American ep economic despair in the eastern heartland of America that begins in Mississippi and Louisiana, heads up through the Appalachians, and runs into the Rust Belt. And it is possible to imagine what less skilled people do in New York with people who don't have fancy degrees do because we see it around us every day. And by and large, it's the service economy. It's the service economy that provided jobs when the manufacturing sector, sector disappeared. But what are they going to do in West Virginia? Right? And, and that is a question that, that keeps me up at night frequently. Mm -hmm. And one part of the answer involves some form of creativity around you know, whether it's employing, employment subsidies or vocational training or something in, in the lower density parts of America. But some of the answer is to make sure that the great service economy of America's <laughs> metropolitan areas continues to hum. Because that has been the one uh, oasis right, of employment for less skilled, less skilled Americans. And it is so crucial, and I'm just going to end on this, that like our federal government policies echoing back there don't act as if our cities are somehow other the enemies. It's important that they push towards more affordable housing in cities, whether or not that's pushing to encourage more, more construction or pushing to, to subsidize it. But it's also important that we rethink those federal policies that make it, you know, artificially anti-urban, whether or not it's the federal home mortgage interest deduction or subsidizing highways with general tax revenues, which became a mainstay of the last 10 years, or the way that we think about schooling in, in the US as well. Right? All of these things are things which artificially pull people away from cities, where I continue to think that the track record of cities at both enabling people to find a better future and at working miracles from Renaissance art to Athenian philosophy to, to modern technology, the track record of cities is amazing. And the age of urban miracles is not over. It can still flourish, and it should be embraced at the national level. That was a perfect conclusion. Um, we're out of time. Thank you all so much. Thank you to another creation of the city, the Museum of the City of New York, this great institution. Ed Glazer, Miriam Greenberg, thank you for coming.